It was just moving in position now. This is the moment detectives arrested one of Britain's most prolific serial killers. He's kicked off. He's kicked off. They're in round the corner. He's kicked off. But this story started 20 years earlier on a game show watched by millions across the country. As the contestant, John Cooper, talked about his favourite pastimes... You've got an unusual hobby, John, haven't you? Oh, yes, the scuba diving. The scuba diving. No one could know that this charming Welshman was a double murderer and that just weeks after this appearance, he would kill twice more. The murders lay unsolved until a crack team of investigators reopened the case set on uncovering evidence to prove John Cooper was a dangerous multiple murderer. I needed to know John William Cooper better than he knew himself. Had we been our mastermind, then that would have been our specialist subject. But detectives found they faced a game-playing psychopath determined to outwit them, and a bitter battle began. I am not a murderer. I don't care whether you believe it or not. I am not a murderer. Now, I've been given exclusive access to hundreds of hours of behind-the-scenes police footage. The net has been slowly closing in around you. You're making things try to fit to John Cooper. It reveals for the first time the remarkable gamble police took in this high-stakes game of cat and mouse. Because it all lies. I'm, I'm fed up being called a liar. I'm trying to help you people. Is he playing a psychological game with you? It is bizarre behaviour. Sort of smug arrogance that he thought he'd got away with murder. One room, one suspect. Could police nail their man before time ran out? There's a chance that he would offend again, and if he offends again, he would kill again. Pembrokeshire in Wales is one of the safest places to live in the country. But in the 1980s, two horrific double murders had rocked this community. Hello, good evening. The hunt for the killers of a Pembrokeshire brother and sister has spread to London, Wiltshire and Liverpool. In 1985, reclusive brother and sister Richard and Helen Thomas were found shot dead in the burned-out wreckage of their farmhouse. Miss Thomas had been bound and gagged, as well as shot viciously in the head. Four years later, the killer struck again, this time in broad daylight on the popular Welsh coastal path. 51-year-old Peter Dixon and his 52-year-old wife Gwenda were found shot dead in what police describe as an horrific double murder. But despite a huge manhunt, no one was caught for either of these double murders and the trail ran cold. Until police reopened the files nearly a decade later. I want to get behind the scenes of this cold case inquiry. With years separating the crime and the investigation, these cases can be the hardest to crack. When a crime scene is long gone, evidence is scant and memories faded, these tapes are a unique insight into how the suspect interview becomes critical. And I'm meeting the detectives who look to the latest forensic science for answers as they set out to finally catch a serial killer who'd haunted their community for a generation. Did you feel under enormous pressure? <laughs> because these were huge, violent, unsolved crimes. Yeah, you know, we obviously wanted a result because you had, like, horrendous offences that had happened and there were the victim's family out there who were still, all these years later, looking for answers. So you have that feeling of burden that you want to get justice for those families. After the alarm was raised, the police had found first the couple's belongings still inside their tent near the coastal path. Peter Dixon and his wife Gwenda haven't been seen since Thursday. Almost 10 years on, detectives went back to the murder site 
hoping to use their local knowledge to build a new profile of the murderer. The actual scene of the recovery of the bodies is just in front of us, and from then there's a sheer drop of 200 feet. Gwenda's body was found just a few feet away from the actual cliff edge. She was partly clothed. Then Peter Dixon's body then was hands tied behind his back, and he was partially hanging over the cliff it itself. Peter was shot three times to the upper chest, to his back, and then the final shot, he was shot in the head. Whoever was there waiting in ambush had a very clear view along the coastal path. Why would you come here unless you had local knowledge of potentially what you were going to find? Convinced the murderer was a local man, police looked back at other crimes committed in the area, hoping they might offer a clue. In this peaceful part of Wales, one spate of vicious burglaries caught their eye. There was a number of quite violent robberies where females had been attacked in their homes. They'd been subjected to excessive violence and force. And detectives realised there was a crucial and disturbing link between these multiple burglaries and the double murders. When I looked at the actual, the MO, the method of operating by the offender, they had attacked uh, multiple victims, controlled them with a sawn-off shotgun, and there was also uh, an attempt to steal as well. If you take out the actual murder side of it, the um, circumstances of those offences were identical. The man responsible for these vicious burglaries was John Cooper, who was sent to prison for the crimes. But his sentence had started nine years after the last murders. The 53-year-old was described as self-employed. He's been accused of 16 burglaries and attempted burglaries in the Milford Haven, Nayland and Rosemarket areas of Pembrokeshire. Police trawled their evidence archive for anything linked to the burglar John Cooper and were astonished by what they found. There was quite an extensive uh, range and variety of different property which had been stolen from houses. Keys for people's houses. There was gloves which were found discarded near to his home. Jewelry which was found in the hedgerows. So there was a full range of property there which he had kept which were mementos of his offended. These sinister souvenirs suggested John Cooper had been hoarding trophies of his crimes. Then they had another breakthrough. Hello? In their own archives Hello? were hours of footage of John Cooper being questioned by police after his arrest. Right, we are still investigating a series of burglaries committed throughout the 80s and well into the 90s. What can you tell about him from his body language? There's no engagement with the Intoon officers, so to me, I'd say at that point, it's clear that he's not going to be um, talking to them in that interview. And then sits side on, you know, head down. Just strikes me as childlike. Are you prepared to tell us how this necklace came into your possession? Here was a chance to find out more about the violent burglar who might also be a serial killer. Now, these items have been recovered in your bedroom. They have come from the burglary. Do you want to give an explanation as to how that has happened? Detectives studied these police tapes, hoping that they held the key to cracking a murder case that had eluded them for 20 years. This is actually a treasure trove of information for you. Yeah, it's, it is bizarre behavior. Real distraction, sort of, and avoidance techniques, where he'd sit with his fingers in his ears. Because it's about control, isn't it, if you're in an interview? Simple explanation will do. Detectives then discovered that while John Cooper had been burgling, he'd been a local farm labourer, living in the neighbourhood with his wife and children. John William Cooper was somebody that I felt had sort of two personas. He presented to some as this family man, fiercely loyal. However, there was clearly this real sinister man 
This is somebody who was going through the fields at night, cutting fences. He was lying in wait, surveilling the houses before going in. One particular fence, he threw a television at the head of one of them, kicked the victims, uh, tied them up, and continually started to go back to them and hit them with the butt of the gun. And to me, it was as if the person was actually enjoying what they were doing. Detectives believed Cooper's violent crimes and his controlling behavior in custody could match the profile of the murderer, but they needed more proof. In the cold case files, they found a wanted poster of a man who had used one of the victim's cash point cards just hours after they were murdered. I can particularly remember the artist's impression poster being in the bus shelter of the village, which I grew up in. There would have been you know, discussions with my friends then around, oh, you know, my Lord, there's somebody living around here who's, who's done these fences. Police now needed to know if the mystery man could possibly be John Cooper. It was quite important that we tried to get a, an image of him, of how he was around the time, certainly, of the Dixon's murder, so we could then compare it with the artist's impression. The detectives had an extraordinary find. In 1989, the same year as one of the double murders, their suspect had been a contestant on the popular game show Bullseye. You've got an unusual hobby, John, haven't you? Oh, yes, the scuba diving. The scuba the, diving. The well, it, apparently, it's, it's the place to do it down there, isn't it? Oh, we've got coastline. Because, yeah, because yeah. The, it's, is it the mountains are sort of inverted and you've got all these... Well, we've got the deep water where, where you can sort of uh, swim over mountains and all sorts of things. Yeah. Place. We hope you all have a good night with us. Give them a round of applause. Thank you. Just three weeks after this episode was filmed, Peter and Gwenda Dixon were shot dead on the coastal path. You've got 220 pounds. What are you going to do? We'd like to gamble. There it is. We managed to then freeze John Cooper in exactly the same position as the artist impression, and for me, it was like a tracing. The way he was standing, his build, the hair, the scraggly hair, the sort of shoulder length, uh, the unkempt look and moustache. A senior investigating officer or advisor, I showed it to him, and uh, his response to me was, fucking hell, Wilkie, it's him. 18 months into the cold case investigation of two brutal double murders, and police were struggling. Their prime suspect, John Cooper, was in prison for violent robbery, but coming to the end of his 16-year sentence. Police needed to act fast to nail Cooper before he was released, so they devised an audacious plan. We are looking at somebody who's potentially has committed four murders and has no compunction at all in using excessive violence. It was a very, very daunting task. We needed to get him talking. We needed to try and elicit from him something that we could go back and look at and say, why did he say that? In a bold move that would make or break the investigation, the team were given just four days to interview the man they suspected was a psychopath and a serial killer. They needed a watertight strategy. This is a person without having to say very much just through his physical presence or just his look can intimidate people. So I needed to make sure they had people who would not be intimidated. Gareth, affectionately known as Rambo, a rugby player, as tough as nails at Louise. She was a very good interviewer. I knew that she was somebody that would maintain uh, focus. Cooper had refused to speak when questioned before, so detectives studied the police tapes they'd found, trying to find the key to make him talk. I needed to know John William Cooper better than he knew himself. If we'd been our mastermind, then that would have been our specialist subject. Police also re-examined the burglaries that Cooper had committed, trying to find anything in common between them and the unsolved murders. Two of those they interviewed were John and Marie, who lived less than a mile from Cooper. John. And which houses here had he already targeted? Um, two down the lane, the one on the corner, uh, this one, uh, next door but one, 
and the top one twice. And terrifyingly, as he fled an attempted robbery of a neighbor, a balaclava-clad Cooper had confronted John at gunpoint. So tell me what happened that night. He come out the door. I show his stop. And he's got the gun pointing at me. And he said, go back or I'll shoot you. I went back. What did you feel at that moment? When I saw the state this woman was in, that was made me really angry. She still had the rope on her wrist. Do you think you had a lucky escape that night? I did. I feel I did, yes. Now, as he was brought from prison for questioning about murder, police planned to use Cooper's targeting of women against him. Part of the reasoning for me to introduce a female police officer was most of his excessive violence had been against females. And I, I was trying to see what his reaction would be. It would either be a, a master stroke or a disaster stroke. We saw him walk in. The first thing that struck me was that he was a very well-built, still look an athletic 60-year-old, brimming with confidence, but also quite clearly he was looking at his surroundings and trying to anticipate and prepare himself. It had taken six months of study and strategic planning. Now the whole investigation rested on this first meeting. I'm walking towards the interview room and I'm, you know, having all those thoughts. I'd be lying if I said I didn't feel that pressure. I remember sort of steadying myself and sort of having that internal conversation of, right, you know, calm yourself now. This is the person who's committed these horrendous offences and nearly was sitting in front of me. What struck me was his piercing eyes. I think he was sussing me out. A sort of glance, sideways glances from him, really, where he was probably trying to, to get the measure of me then, as much as I was doing the same to him. And I'm interviewing, can you please state your full name and date of birth? Uh, John William Cooper, the 3rd of September, 1944. I am DS Gareth The other police officer present is... DC Louise Harris. They were faced with the man who they believed had murdered four times. But would he answer any of their questions? You're here to be interviewed in connection with the murder of Richard Helen Thomas on the 22nd of December, 1985 and also the murder of Gwendolyn Peter Dixon on the coastal path near Little Haven, Pembrokeshire, on the 29th of June, 1989. So is he going to answer no comment? There was that sort of bated breath feeling, really, amongst the investigation team as to which way these interviews are going to go. Can you describe your character to me? And he spoke. <laughs> How do you describe yourself? Right. I'm a helpful person. Right. Uh, I believe in helping people. That's yeah. the way I was brought up. Yeah. I'm 64 years old. That's the way yeah. you were brought up. Yeah. I'm respectful of people. Yeah. Um, it's like the, the game has started. All the nervousness is left in the changing room. The police strategy was to play to Cooper's ego and make him feel at ease. So the questioning at first was more of a conversation. I believe myself to be the most positive person that maybe anybody sees, because I can always evolve. I couldn't turn on a computer before I went to, to uh, prison, right? So, so even in the blackest times, if you look this positive things. As the interviews went on, and he sort of relaxed into that, really, and I think probably at that point got a sense of he probably could take us where he wanted to, and we might not quite get him. And there was that sort of perhaps sense of sort of smug arrogance that would have um, come from him then, that he thought he'd got away with murder. Now they had him talking, the police needed Cooper to reveal information about the crimes they suspected he'd committed. 
but they soon realised he had his own strategy of denial and distraction. We are investigating offences in which the use of a shotgun is evident. What can you tell me about that? It was a sort of cat and mouse, really, I suppose, in an interview. About? I don't understand. Because for everything we asked him, he's having to think ahead as to why we're asking that and where they're coming from. Okay. You're investigating... Sorry, well, I might be a bit slow here. You're investigating events of a shotgun. We're, we're investigating offences where shotguns were used? Yes. Yeah, OK, yeah, can yeah. you tell me about any shotguns you had in your possession in 1989? Uh, in, in, I had none in 89. Right. Can you tell me what shotguns you had access to at that time? None. Is he playing a psychological game with you, do you think? Yeah, and he's, he's trying to guess where we are and trying to stay one step ahead of us. Whatever's presented with him, he will adapt and he will deal with that situation as it arises. Tell me whether you're the person responsible for shooting Peter Dixon? No, not me. Tell me whether you were the person responsible for reloading a shotgun at that location? No, not me. Explain to me whether you were responsible for using branches or undergrowth to conceal their bodies? No, it wasn't me. Okay. He's denying that he's responsible for murder. What's going through your head? As the interviews progressed, I'm, I'm more and more convinced that he is, yeah. That this is somebody who's capable of committing these horrendous, violent offences. The detectives were determined to catch Cooper in his lies. Over the four days, they painstakingly picked through the evidence. Crucially, they needed to link him to a gun found near his home after his arrest for burglary. They were convinced it was his, but when asked, Cooper feigned ignorance. It appears to be a slightly rusty barrel, single barrel. Is that what, yeah, is that what it is? Yeah. Okay. Have you ever seen that before? I'm not, I'm, I, I, I don't know. He was writing throughout the interviews, making notes. One particular interview, I clearly thought, hang on now, why is he writing that? There's something significant about that. What is it about this gun that's unnerving him? And I was taking out of the hedge at St Mary's Bay. Yes, didn't um, which, which hedge, did you say? Sorry, it was coming from the hedge all alongside the garden shed. Yeah, OK. It's an odd question for him to ask. Which hedge did you find the gun in? I think he's given himself thinking time, to be honest. What do you think he was worried about? He was worried that um, I can only assume that with the advances in forensic technology, if we still had that gun, then we could do further work with it. For me, that was a real key moment. Why are you worried about that gun? There was a clear moment of realisation is that we had probably identified the murder weapon. But as Cooper had denied owning the gun, detectives needed to find a way to link him to the weapon. The gun had been examined in the forensics lab when it was found, but nothing connected it to Cooper or to the murders. My biggest fear was, what have I missed here? because I know that that firearm was maximised at the lab. Areas were swabbed, potentially, for a few cells of DNA. Uh, it was taken to uh, a significant in-depth examination of that weapon. What hadn't we done? Ten years had passed since it was last tested. With the latest forensics, could police now prove that this was Cooper's murder weapon? Was Cooper forensically aware? I believe so. Um, he was no fool. He'd go gloved up, he'd go masked up. There were no fingerprints. Um, there was no DNA evidence. 
So basically, I'm looking for that golden nugget, something that will give us concrete evidence to identify the offender. I'm looking for that needle in a haystack. John Cooper's sentence for burglary was nearly over. Soon, he would be returning to his wife, Pat, and their children. And police were powerless to stop him. We are made aware that Patty's wife is very, very uncomfortable with that, but clearly she has absolutely no choice. And we are aware that he is telling her that he can't wait to carry on their, their loving relationship. The clock is ticking for us at that moment in time because he's shown no remorse. He has not accepted anything that he's done. So I am anticipating there's a chance that he would offend again. And if he offends again, he would kill again. My team are members of the same community. All of us live within very, very close proximity to John Cooper. The village he was released to was the village that I was born and brought up in. I still had friends and family living in that area and wasn't able to obviously share with them the fact that he was in that community. So there was some sort of anxiety around that for me personally. John Cooper was released from prison. Just two months later, Detective Steve Wilkins received a phone call. I get a call from the control room. In, in my half sleep, I hear a voice at the end, which is the control room inspector, and it said, uh, boss, are you on call tonight? And I said, yes. He said, we've just had a call from John Cooper. Um, his wife's dead. We think he's murdered her. Police tapes show that even after hours of interview, detectives had failed to nail the man they suspected of four murders. And now his wife was dead. His verbal statement was he went to, 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 to meet with his wife, that um, they had had a very pleasant evening uh, together, and that um, they went to bed, and that he, in the night he heard her gasping and tried to revive her, and she was dead. It is quite a, a, a believable account. My problem was I had somebody who I was quite happy had already murdered four people. I always personally felt that Pat had a story to, to tell. John Cooper and his seamstress wife, Pat, had been together since they were 18. She'd stayed with him throughout his prison sentence. But police knew she'd been dreading his release. I'm very much in the hands of the pathologist. I said, I want to know from you, has he killed her or has she died of natural circumstances? I said, please don't sit on the fence. And when he came back to me, he was quite clear that her heart was, he, he described it as the size of a football. She died of natural circumstances. I just think that Pat knew exactly what the rest of her life was going to be like. She knew that she was going to be sharing the home with this violent man man who I was quite happy with killed people. I just think that Pat gave up. Cooper was back in the community he'd once terrorized. Police were convinced he was a serial killer, but they still had no proof and now no grounds to question him again. How much pressure did you and your team feel like you were under? Um, pressure wise, I brought my children up in this area. I'm now bringing my grandchildren up in this area. You've got to think to yourself, have I got a serial killer living amongst us? So I was getting close to a million pounds then that had been spent on the forensic budget. And I just felt a bit uncomfortable about the results we weren't getting back. In despair, lead detective Steve Wilkins called in the head of forensics, Angela Gallup. I met up with Steve Wilkins and his team and I have to say, the, the atmosphere was incredibly frosty. It was, it was lively, I would describe it as. He said, look, you've had this case for 18 months, you haven't found anything, and so we're thinking of taking the case off you. And of course, to someone like me, that's um, it's like a red rag <laughs> to, to a ball. So I said, well, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. 
I really had to convince Steve that we were far from the end of the road. I managed to persuade him anyway, first of all, not to take the case of us, and secondly, to allow us to start doing textile fibre work. Forensics now had to decide what to test with these new fibre methods. Faced with thousands of items, they chose clothing that was similar to a description of what the murderer might have been wearing. A pair of shorts were sent for analysis, and it was the breakthrough they'd been searching for. We were looking for textile fibre links on this item, and we noticed, we noticed a tiny fragment of what looked like blood. We did some DNA profiling. Then I rang Steve Wilkins, because I thought, well, this is probably what he was after. She said, Steve, are you driving? And I said, yes, Angela, but it's OK, I'm on hands-free. Uh, no, Steve, you need to pull over. So I pulled the car over and she said, you know that golden nugget? She says, we got it. We've got a blood flake from the shorts in Cooper's home that matches Peter Dixon's. I just was, was banging the steering wheel. I was, uh, I was shouting um, a few tears. Um, it was a, a real emotional moment. It was one in one billion chance, uh, which is the highest actual discriminating value you can get. That was the missing link. That was the golden nugget. You know, we'd now got the, the blood of the victim on a pair of shorts found in John Cooper's house, shorts which were identical to shorts worn by the offender and the artist impression. Put the picture of the shorts up with the words, got the bastard. The speck of blood on the shorts was from the murder victim. It was the damning evidence police so desperately needed. We're just moving into position now. And three years after the cold case reopened, John Cooper was arrested for murder. He's kicked off. He's kicked off. They're in round the corner. He's kicked off. Now detectives had 24 hours to question and charge Cooper. If he admitted owning the shorts, he would be linked to the victims, and a conviction for murder would be much more likely. The main objective for a particular interview around the shorts was for John Cooper to accept that those shorts were his shorts. Okay, you ready? Yes. We went about it in a roundabout way, and I think we went from the boots up. Would you have had a possession of boots similar to that description in 1989, which is the year that Gwen and Peter Dixon yeah, possibly. were Possibly. I always had um, tough black working boots. Okay. Can you see there? There's a pair of shorts. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Were they? Are they your shorts? Um, if they were in the house, most probably yes. Okay. Okay. Whilst we were talking about boots and socks, it was the shorts we really wanted, and it was almost a sort of High five under the table moment without showing him the significance of what he just said. By withholding the discovery of the victim's blood on the shorts, police had led Cooper into a trap. He now said the shorts were his. But as he was insisting that they were different from the artist's impression, he led them to a breakthrough. Those are long legged shorts. Okay, you're pointing the difference then. You say that they're not similar and that they're longer on the artist's impression. Well, those are short leg shorts. That's long legged shorts. I think he's mocking us almost and saying, don't be silly now. These are different shorts. These are short shorts. They're long shorts. And I can clearly see his face where he was quite sort of smug, saying, ah, no, but they're short shorts. John, you're seeing the artist's impression, GDR2, has got long legged shorts. What I would call yeah. long legged shorts. And that the photograph is shown of shorts. Sees for an open address a short leg shorts. Yeah, bathing type shorts. And you're saying that those are your bathers? I would imagine so, yeah. yes. Okay, thank you. The more that John Cooper tried to explain the differences in the artist's impression and the, the shorts that he was accepting were his, the more it became clear that there was perhaps a bit more to this. Thank you. Thank you. We knew. Cooper's wife 
was a seamstress. The next obvious step is to unpick the hem of the shorts. They recovered DNA material which matched Mr. and Mrs. Dixon's daughter. As there was no link between Cooper and the murdered couple's daughter, the DNA find was proof that the shorts originally belonged to the Dixons, but were taken by Cooper as a trophy after he'd murdered Peter and Gwenda. Cooper collected things, all right? As part of his offending, uh, he collected souvenirs. Here is an individual flaunting things in front of people and not being picked up for it. Thinking he could get away with not just the murders, but wearing the clothing of the murder victims. Yeah. Yes. Police now move to challenge Cooper with this new damning evidence. Have you any explanation to give as to how that blood could have innocently appeared on the shorts? I really do not know. As I said, my wife sourced the shorts. So when he was confronted with the forensic evidence on the shorts, even then he sort of started distancing himself. But even the detectives were shocked by quite how far Cooper would go once cornered by the truth. More worryingly is my son used to take my clothes whenever he wanted it. And that would be more of a worry for a father. He would take whatever he wanted, whatever he needed. What do you make of the way that he talks about his son? By suggesting there's something suspicious about his behaviour. We call him on that and say, are you saying your son's committed these offences? He pulls it back then and, oh, no, I'm not saying that. But clearly that's what he's suggesting, isn't it? So... Does it feel at this point like you are closing the net around him? Yeah, definitely. At this point, it's, um, his explanation's far-fetched and becoming somewhat ludicrous, really. Adrian Cooper believes that everything in this planet is his if he wants it. Okay. The way he referenced his son was always in his full name, so Adrian Cooper. That comes across as very distant and cold, which I think is really the relationship that they had. I shouted a lot due to the behaviour of my son. I never, ever hit him in my life, despite what he says, never. But detectives had already spoken to Cooper's son, Adrian, who'd revealed a lifetime of terror at the hands of his violent and deceitful father. When I was nine, um, was the first time that my father got violent with me. He wouldn't treat me like a child. He would come at me frothing at the mouth. His eyes would be bulging. He'd expand himself, he'd clench his fists, and he would lay into me like like I was made of rubber. He, he purposely bounced me off door frames and just throw me around like I was a doll. But to everyone else, when he was in the pub or out playing darts or social life, patting him on the back, good old Johnny. <laughs> His son was uh, grew up terrified of him. John Cooper had um, killed their own family dog, dug a pit and beat the dog to death with the shovel. There was um, glimpses from, from Adrian coming through of the, the sort of the character that he knew his father to be and you know that fear that, that would have gone on in that, in that household over the years then. John Cooper had led forensics to uncover evidence linking him to brutal killings he thought he'd got away with. The fact is, John, that the net has been slowly closing in around you. And with the latest forensic results, it's provided us with strong evidence. But now, as he was challenged with all the evidence, he was arrogantly protesting his innocence. It's, it strikes me. Everything is put to you. There's always been somebody else to blame. There's always somebody else who's a liar. There's always somebody else who's the criminal. But everything my colleague has put to you today, it all comes back to you. And that is why you were here today, yeah, isn't it? Because that's your outlook of every damn thing. Oh, yes, put them all on to John Cooper, because that's good and proper. 
Forget about Adrian Cooper. Forget about all of them. It's only John Cooper. You're making things try to fit to John Cooper, and it's bloody annoying. We got this friends again. It all comes back. You know, I just young lady, I once said, you're trying to make things fit. You choose, you, you all, and your colleagues, and them in there, choose not to believe it, to look elsewhere. No matter how man she'd managed to control himself at that moment, we saw the glimpse of the real John Cooper. Because it all lies. I'm, I'm fed up being called a liar. I'm trying to help you people. This investigation's gone on um, for several years, OK? But the facts are, throughout this inquiry, the only person that we haven't been able to eliminate and whose name constantly crops up, be it forensically or otherwise linked to this offence, and see the offences is you, OK? Because that's all you want to look at. OK. The time now is 17.01, and no further questions, and turn the tape recorder off. The interviews were over, but forensics were still at work, re-examining a gun in the hope of finally nailing the murder weapon. We were interested in this because in the bottom of the bag that the gun was in, we noticed some flakes of black paint because the barrels had been painted black and some of this was flaking off. Catching the light in a certain way that they had a reddish tinge to them. And of course, anything red to a forensic scientist is usually very interesting if you're looking for blood. So we quickly tested it and of course we discovered that it was indeed blood. In each case, both from the paint flakes and from the stain on the, the gun barrels themselves, we got a DNA match with Peter Dixon. The blood that forensics found proved that the gun was the murder weapon. And a new forensics technique proved fibers found on one of Cooper's gloves came from a sock worn by the murder victim, Richard Thomas. Police now had the missing links of a puzzle unsolved for more than 20 years. We know about John Cooper that he's a game player, he's a risk taker, but he's also someone who likes to think he's one step ahead of the police. But in the case of the forensics, he gave himself away. Uh, I feel that he thought he was untouchable, um, but his arrogance was his downfall. By painting the barrels, he's protected the forensic evidence from that crime scene for us. There was no get out of jail card on that. 24 years after the murder of brother and sister Richard and Helen Thomas. 20 years after the murder of husband and wife Peter and Gwenda Dixon. The skillful combination of forensic investigation and interrogation meant that the cold case which had haunted a community could be closed. John Cooper finally faced trial for murder. Finally, the families have some element of closure. It's only perhaps when I went home that evening and I was on my own and able to reflect upon it that I did perhaps then realise the significance that this has had you know, and to be part of this investigation and to be part of this team. Some of the memories remain with me for the rest of my career. Having been involved in this for many years, all of a sudden I was in a lift, coming down in a lift from the 20th floor to the ground floor, knowing I wouldn't be going back up. It's over. This team was, was different. It was that personal commitment. It was actually described as one of the finest investigations of the history of British policing.